Hi, I'm Jen, and you're watching Crypto Vantage. Well, Aletheia AI is mixing worlds of AI and NFTs to bring smart NFTs to the metaverse. I'm joined by CEO Arif Khan. He's going to introduce us to iNFTs. Hello, Arif. Hey, Jen. It's good to be here. It's great to have you. Now, we're adding another letter to NFTs. And this year, I think a lot of people have just figured out what an NFT is. And now we have INFTs. So please just explain to us what INFTs are so we can tee up what we're going to be chatting about today. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so INFTs are intelligent NFTs. We consider NFTs or at least a present version of still image NFTs, what you call a PFP project, another acronym for you, right? Where you have a board ape or a crypto punk or um, a cool cat. Those are largely still images. What we are doing with NFTs is we're taking that still image and bringing it to life, right? So we're adding intelligence to it in the form of AI, and then it'll start you'll be able to interact and talk and engage with you in real time. And so that's that's what an INFT is. Uh, it, it allows, it's an asset that uh, can interact with you and has intelligence embedded in it. Okay, so this invention really came directly out of your brain. I'm sure that you had a team that you worked with on it, but just tell me about the moment when you were, when you were sitting there and you thought, like, this is what we need to build to get to the future that we're envisioning. Yeah, I mean, when I first uh, wrote about it on uh, 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 almost two years ago, uh, the concept of combining blockchain and AI was a little bit too soon, and uh, people felt that uh, the concept was maybe directionally sound, but maybe five to ten years away. And I think we really struggled for people to understand how we, we call it synthetic media, AI-generated media. It looks like the real thing, it talks like the real thing, but it's not the real thing, right? So you have... Uh, deep fakes that were getting very popular towards the end of 2018, 2019, I started looking at the research there and felt that this would transform content creation completely because if you don't need a video to capture light and if you don't need a human uh, to act or record uh, and if, it's, if everything is AI generated, uh, what will that do to the content creation business when you can have synthetic voices, synthetic faces, uh, and now synthetic intelligence, right? So for us, uh, uh, combining these two worlds and how the blockchain would fit was extremely challenging. Uh, once we had a clear breakthrough, which was uh, we started looking at the NFT as a property rights layer, right? NFTs uh, present an opportunity for ownership of a specific asset. And you could own a piece of land in a virtual metaverse. You could own uh, an asset in the real world. Uh, or you could own a PFP or JPEG file, right? Uh, all of these things provide a, a great, it, it's a great primitive to ownership. For us, the next question became, how can NFTs own intelligence or an AI algorithm? Is that is that really possible for us? And so what we did was we created the first INFT. Uh, we partnered closely with a company called OpenAI, which was developing this uh, technology called a large language model. Uh, it's just basically an AI engine that whatever it can, it, it replicates human speech and text, right? So we launched the first INFT, her name was Alice, and. Uh, we auctioned her off on open, uh, on on Sotheby's. Uh, she successfully auctioned for almost uh, half a million dollars. And what the buyer essentially got was they got an interactive, intelligent experience and an NFT who was trained on the Bitcoin white paper of Satoshi Nakamoto. But because her name is also Alice, she was trained on the lore and mythology of Lewis Carroll, where she could talk about Alice in Wonderland. So when you talk with this INFT and if you ask her, what uh, the cryptocurrency is or where she is, she'll be able to answer those questions really well. And once we asked her even where she was, so she said she was in a decentralized crypto rabbit hole. Right? So she's able to combine all of these <laughs> answers in a, in a very unique way. So for us, the ability to fuse these two exponential technologies, it took us a lot of time and research to do that. But once we started seeing that it was actually reasonably and technically possible, um, uh, the market really responded uh, really well to it. You, you mentioned that NFTs bring this ownership layer to content creation. And I know that uh, you've done some experimenting with, with CryptoPunks and there's a CryptoPunk on your book that uses the, the technology. And with CryptoPunks in particular, when you own one of them, you actually don't own the rights 
to to do what you please with them. So how does that kind of change um, your vision for the possibilities of these INFTs? Yeah, so there's like a, a spectrum of ownership. Uh, so you have, for example, let's say the board apes that have uh, very liberal terms of service where people can actually merchandise, create derivative IP, derivative content based on the asset that they own. And then there are a little bit more conservative uh, uh, applications like uh, Lava Labs has done. Um, they, they must have good reason for it as well. Principally, from my understanding, they do it to protect because they were an original project and there were so many copycats coming out. They essentially have to file a ton of DMCA notices to all of the copycats to not take that, right? So if they had an open IP approach uh, and if they were completely decentralized, who would be filing those to, to preserve the provenance and the strength of that IP? So uh, all approaches, uh, it, the, the industry is still emerging there. But for us, I think what's exciting is an approach like Bored Apes, or even in the sense when uh, uh, companies like Larva Labs, they may have restrictive terms of service, but at the same time, they're not going to go and enforce it against an individual crypto punk owner who wants to bring it to life, right? So, so that's where it starts to get really interesting when people can actually own the asset, own the IP, and are then able to create derivative works from it. So for us, that's, that's where it gets really exciting. It's so funny, you gave um, us a demo before we started this interview and I've done some poking around on the website. And this really reminds me of, I don't, you probably know the character Lil Michaela, who is an influencer on social media, right? She is completely AI generated. She's not real. She has an album on Spotify um, and she has over a million followers. So we can really see the window into what this technology is bringing. In her case, though, there's no NFT involved. So can you just talk us through the difference? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Michaela is uh, the creation of Brud, which is uh, a, a, a studio that creates CGI content. Uh, and Michaela's IP is essentially owned by Brud. Right? So like that's a very important distinction. There's a team, a content team that is curating the IP. And then the videos are generated after much curation, much thought, uh, you know, working with creatives, there's an entire creative production cycle that it goes through. It's a very different beast compared to what we're doing. What we're doing is we're making these characters live, interactive, and in real time. No content team is required. These characters are spontaneously generating their dialogues based on the AI that we have uh, given them, right? So this is like a foundational and directional difference as to how quickly the speed of the technology is evolving from our standpoint. But what's also interesting is in our case, if you own that character, you also own its underlying intelligence and you're able to train that character's intelligence just like you would, for example, uh, train a child's intelligence as it matures over time, right? So so that's how we, we, we think about this new paradigm that's emerging where content creation, that content production cycle is going to get shortened, but also at the same time, uh, because people are owning the assets, they will also be able to train and upgrade the intelligence of that specific asset. My mind is just kind of blown right now. So. After this interview, I'm going to talk to Sophia. Like I mentioned before, we had a little conversation with one of the AIs uh, on your website. Tell me about Sophia and why bringing her to life as an NFT um, was important to kind of bring you to your next milestone. Yeah, I think for us, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really exciting IP to work with. The company that owns that IP is a company called Being AI that is working closely with Hanson Robotics. And so Being AI approached us and said, hey, we have this really cool IP. It's a static image right now. Uh, we'd love to bring it to life and we'd love to give her intelligence and personality and wit and all of these cool things that you might notice when you talk to some of these characters. But uh, and, and so once, once we started having a chat with them, we discovered that actually there's a real organic fit here because Sophia in the real world is a robot. And now as she evolves into the metaverse, she's evolving in an anime form and she's becoming an anime version of herself. And there are 100 collections of her that represent all of the diverse cultures on earth. And the opportunity here is for people to be able to own Sophia's INFT, the intelligence NFT, but also to be able to train it in their specific culture or language or nuance. So you'll notice out of this collection of 100 uh, INFTs, 
you'd find uh, Sophias that are dedicated to certain oceans or certain mountains or certain, or, or basically the Earth, uh, Earth's geography and certain cultures as well are, are, are represented. So from that perspective, it's going to be exciting to see the evolution and how people decide to evolve Sophia's intelligence from the conversations they have with her. For us, that's like moving NFTs just beyond the static images and giving them actual functional utility so that Sophia's uh, can also perform functions and services and jobs in the future in the metaverse. So for us, uh, uh, for example, like the INFT of Sophia can, uh, at this specific level, when you interact with her, you can have a real-time interaction. But later on, as she evolves and grows in intelligence, you would be able to tell uh, the INFT of Sophia being AI that, hey, Sophia, can you create an artwork for me? And based on her personality and her language structure and what she's trained on, she would be able to generate a spontaneous work of art, which you as an owner might be able to sell as an NFT. Yeah, the metaverse really has so many options for us to explore. I think, uh, like I was saying, we spent this year figuring out what NFTs are. Now everyone's talking about the metaverse. And I think we're going to spend next year really understanding the utility behind NFTs, like you said, and, and how they can work for us beyond them being JPEGs that we own that are attached to the certificate. So I want you to break it down for me just even a little bit further. So the metaverse um, that um, Aletheia AI is envisioning is called Noah's Ark, right? Tell me about Noah's Ark and how these INFTs are going to kind of interact with each other and and humans in Noah's Ark. Yeah, so Noah's Ark is a, is, is a perfect metaphor to describe all of the animal PFP projects and all of the human PFP <laughs> projects that are emerging. And so all of them are coalescing and coming together. For us, we're bringing all of these still images to life and infusing each one with AI. And for the from a metaverse standpoint, what, what we really like about NFTs is that they present to us the perfect uh, metaverse lego to build on that allows for decentralization that allows for ownership and that also allows uh, for people to build custom experiences creating actual engagement that people may find useful as opposed to just like scrolling ads on a news feed right so for us uh, the opportunity here is for people to be able to bring the nfts to life to be able to interact on noah's ark we for example have um, a feature uh, that is happening right now is as people interact with the INFTs, where the INFTs are able to battle with each other or humans can go into a conversation and have a logical debate with an INFT uh, on a specific topic. So uh, it trains the INFTs logical reasoning capability. But what we're also finding is that humans themselves are getting trained in the process of how to reason and debate. And so there are many applications that are going to emerge, uh, uh, art, uh, language, uh, the opportunity to preserve culture, uh, for us, the, the Noah's Ark vision really is to preserve and evolve the uh, culture of the human species. So Sophia is, while well, Sophia is not a human and she's a robot, uh, she's also considered part of the broader human family. And so we see this as like a, uh, a giant sort of container or vessel uh, to be as inclusive as possible to uh, all of the creative uh, imagination and possibilities that we humans are dreaming up of. You touched on it a little bit there, but I want to go a little bit deeper. Talk to me about the train to earn model. Yeah, like, like play to earn, uh, our thesis is that uh, play to earn is a very, very powerful paradigm which uh, flips the incentives and gives owners, uh, gives users, uh, game players, an opportunity to earn from the economy they're participating in creating in. Uh, for us, the same thing can happen with train to earn, where you're training your AI. And instead of humans playing the game, the AI might be playing the game for you and it's performing services for you and it's earning rewards for you. So we see, I mean, it's not just from the perspective of like a giant bot army that goes out and earns for you, <laughs> but also at the same time, we see a tremendous opportunity where uh, people would be able to create specific uh, functions or characters um, that are uh, valuable in the metaverse from a service standpoint. So we've had a lot of requests for, from uh, from companies. One of the challenges that uh, Web3 metaverses sometimes suffer from is what is called the empty world problem, where they've built this elaborate landscape, but there are not enough users coming to Web3 because we're still so early. Right? So 
what happens when you have compelling AI characters there that you can go in, interact with, talk with, they can share their story with you, they can engage with you, they can make you laugh or cry, and they can have a discussion with you about specific topics. So for us, this is sort of a, an engagement mechanism, but at the same time, when you as an owner who owns that INFT are going to get rewards for training that INFT and the INFT and the AI embedded in it is going out there and participating in an economy, that's when we think that uh, novel network effects may, may get enabled, and that's the train to earn model. The more AIs are trained, the more possibility there is to earn from that uh, mechanism. It's so funny. I've been in the metaverse before. My character is just running around aimlessly on all of this wide open digital land. And I think if there were some characters to interact with me there, probably it would be a little bit more fun. So it's interesting when we draw a parallel between the physical world and the digital world, right? AI is really um, freeing up our time, taking over the menial tasks that we previously had to do on a day to day so that our time is free to take on tasks that require a little bit more brain power. And it sounds like it's your theory and thesis is that it will be the same in the metaverse by attaching AI to NFTs so that we can create this intelligence to do the menial tasks we don't want to do in the metaverse. Yeah, to, to some degree, uh, you know, to, to prevent the the directional the, the direction that we want to go is in the direction of efficiency but also not dystopia right and the reason why mm -hmm. it won't go into the dystopia direction for us at least from a principal standpoint is that the ownership layer belongs to the user if we do that correctly and we, if we program that correctly, then you could actually have, I mean, we've had some really interesting use cases where people have wanted to recreate cultural icons that represent their culture that, for mm -hmm. example, uh, uh, they, I mean, their culture may be at risk of like cultural erosion or people may be forgetting the language of that specific culture or the myth or the uh, or that entire richness of that specific um, uh, uh, cultural subgroup because we are all sort of living in a, in a some, somewhat monoculture capitalist environment, right? So like if somebody wants to preserve their culture, they can bring their characters back to life as INFTs. That INFT could be uh, a vessel to share and store that information, but also educate people on it. So there are going to be unique cases that emerge. There are going to be jobs that are somewhat menial, but there will always be higher function, higher order, uh, complex tasks that only humans can perform because of our creative capacity. And that goes back to the fact that we haven't fully solved the consciousness problem, right? Like we can mm -hmm. create AI, but they're still somewhat mechanical uh, compared to the instinctive creativity that human beings have. Yeah, it's it's a, a lot to think about. I think we're heading towards a, a really exciting future. I think though that when there's a, there's a large audience that have come to crypto and the NFT space in the last year. And I think that when they listen to this interview, they might feel, I don't want to say fearful, but, but you hear that word a lot when you talk about AI, like, you know, is AI going to take over? And we talk about that in the real world. And now we're talking about that in the metaverse. What would you say to these people who are coming to the space? They've just really understood crypto and blockchain. And now we're introducing AI to the mix. Um, what, what would you say to those people? Yeah, I think in general, like, I think fear is a healthy human response to technologies that uh, have a higher moral footprint, which is why the, the metaverse, or let's talk about, I mean, whether it's nuclear power, AI, like there are certain technologies that exist that have a higher moral footprint than just like a calculator or something, or an abacus set, right? Like, or a book. A book is also a technology that captures language effectively, like the Gutenberg Press, what it did was it democratized a lot of that, right? So the, the complexity here is there are certain technologies that if they are not applied correctly, the harm to human beings may be exponential. And those technologies have a higher moral footprint. Nuclear power is one of them. I think the metaverse is also one of them, uh, which is why it's important for people to educate themselves on it. At the same time, empower themselves with the ownership layer, because I think what NFTs have done uh, is, is, is defaulted or at least allowed the, uh, the bending of the metaverse, the arc of the metaverse, a little bit more towards decentralization, right, as opposed to centralization, which, which I think overall may, may be a very, very positive development. I think if we can do that with AI as well, um, and people educate themselves and own AI agents and own AI characters, you'd have an opportunity for people to bring their imaginations to life and have actual AI companions and friends that they own. So there's a movie like uh, with Scarlett Johansson called Her, where there's a centralized company that owns uh, the 
AI being, uh, which Scarlett Johansson plays, right? Her, and then one day they do an update, and Joaquin Phoenix, the character, falls in love with her. But all at the same time, and now that company is mediating all of that technology, that relationship. In this case, where what we are proposing is that Joaquin Phoenix actually owns the AI agent, right? And is able to understand that relationship and build that. And how he decides to evolve that character, that's up to him. And that's up to the human human condition. But at least that uh, power dynamic is a little bit more shifted to the individual. So I'm a little bit more idealistic in this direction. I think that AI does have a very high moral footprint and people should be fearful. But we have a little bit of, um, we, we have the benefit of understanding what has happened in the NFT space to at least try and tilt it a little bit more towards decentralization. Are you, that was, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I am hopeful. I think we're living in a really exciting time. I think we're seeing um, innovation accelerated at a pace that we have never seen before. And we are moving towards a future that has a lot of opportunity and excitement. Thank you, Arif, so much for joining me today. It was such a pleasure and I cannot wait to talk to Sophia. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Jen, for the wonderful questions. Looking forward to your conversation with her.